We have Amanda Fornelli here with Nepali Properties, and I'm so excited to bring you on as our second official guest. I think Amanda is a superstar. She pretty much does everything with raising private money. She does burrs and she does Airbnbs all in one. And we like to call her the private money queen because she knows everything about private money or at least to the extent where she was able to scale her portfolio exponentially without having to worry about money ever. Zero money down on every single deal. Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I love what you're doing and I'm really honored. Quick correction. So I'm actually more like the private money princess because the private money queen is the almighty Amy Majuri. She's actually a, a coach of mine, but I'm super excited to talk about private money, short-term rentals or any questions that you have today. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and so how did you get started with short-term rentals? Well, we kind of just fell into it. A little background about our company, Nopali Properties. We're a three-person team. So it's myself, my husband, DJ Fornelli, and my brother, Oscar Bustos. And we tackle all the projects together. We started flipping houses back in 20, 2020. And we fell into the Joshua Tree market, which for those of you that don't know, it's a vacation rental market. A lot of Airbnbs, short-term rentals out here. So we started doing fix and flip projects and we were noticing that the end buyers were a ton of investors who wanted Airbnbs in the area. So we started to question ourselves, well, why are all these people buying these properties from us? Maybe we should keep one or two and see what this Airbnb thing is about. So instead of selling off some of, some of those properties, we ended up keeping them for ourselves, building them out, refinancing them and launching them in the, in the Joshua Tree market. That's how we got started. And that's how me and you actually met because I was at a conference where Amy McJury, shout out to Amy, was speaking at, and she mentioned that you, or you, I think you stood up and you mentioned that you did all these deals in Joshua Tree. And that was where we were doing the same thing, the same thing, burrs into Airbnb. And, um, yeah, ever since we've been good friends I and mean, we've been every time I go up there, I always want to find time to see you. We've grabbed drinks together. We've really we've shared resources together and we're pretty much building this as a team. And that's the cool part. Speaking of teams, you said that you were with you're working with your husband and with your brother. How is that? <laughs> it's awesome. Someone asked me that question this past weekend. And what I said is that Working with a family is really hard, but if you can figure it out, it's like the most powerful team you can ever create because you have that family background, you have a shared history, clearly. So if you're able to figure out how to make your relationships work in a business setting, I mean, you're completely unstoppable. So that goes without, but it doesn't go without saying that we do have our challenges. It does get really hard sometimes, but we love working together. And honestly, we make like a really fantastic team. That's awesome. And with this being said, are you, do you guys get into any arguments? Does work ever come home? Like a lot of people have trouble working with close family members. How do you guys manage to do that without any issues? Yeah, we have to create boundaries for ourselves. Like when we're at a family party, we just leave business. We leave business out of the conversation. We just try to really enjoy our family setting and just be in the present, right? But it's funny, DJ, my husband and I, we we are obsessed with real estate. We love it. We talk about it 24 seven. And there are times where we're like laying down to go to bed and we're like, okay, no more real estate. Like we should just rest or change the topic or go to sleep. And we'll cut ourselves off and then we'll be getting ready for bed. And it's real quiet. And then one of us just pops up out of nowhere. is like, Hey, what if we do this with the property? What if we <laughs> add this? So it's really funny because our wheels are constantly turning. And thankfully we're both in a shared space where we're very, very passionate about it. We're able to talk about it without <laughs> annoying one another. So it's really cool, but we do have to create boundaries for ourselves just to make sure that we're taking breaks and getting some quality family time in outside the business. That's really good. So it's definitely possible as long as you can 
make sure that the boundaries are there. And when it comes to planning, do you and DJ lifestyle plan for how you guys are going to incorporate whatever you guys do in your business to revolve around your lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, they're one in the same, really, because when your business is driven by your personal goals and that lifestyle design, you're going to find a lot of synergies in the two. So we always talk about what are we doing next and how does that tie into our purpose? How does that tie into our lifestyle? How does it improve our lifestyle? How could it hurt our lifestyle? So it's a constant conversation. And this is something that our team's really good at. Me, Oscar, and DJ, we have meetings about this regularly, talking about our purpose. What are our goals with the business? How is this going to affect our personal lives? And how is this going to affect other people along the way? So it's a constant conversation. Every time we add a strategy, buy a property, add a teammate, we bring this up because it's so important to being a successful business and a successful team. That's awesome. So knowing this, let's kind of shift towards the roles that you guys have. How do you guys divide up the roles within your business? Yeah, we're very strategic. We have pretty clear roles and responsibilities. And we try to create those roles and responsibilities based on our previous experience or maybe our strengths and skill sets. So what we've done historically is DJ, my husband, he does all of our lead generation and our marketing. He's great. If you've ever met him, you know, he's great with networking with people. He's really great with social cues, like high emotional intelligence, just amazing at building relationships. And to be honest, he's like very, very patient. So when it comes to cold calling or anything on the marketing or lead generation side, he's so patient and he's so great with words. He's a fantastic person for that role. And it's interesting because DJ didn't come from a marketing background, but he's been able to get very, very good at it in a short amount of time, just by immersing himself in education, in marketing, and in real estate, and then getting into the acquisition side of things. So when we have a property lead and we're ready to make an offer on it, we've done our deal analysis. I take over that process. So I'll own the deal analysis. I'll work with DJ to figure out an exit strategy and I'll make the offers on behalf of our team. I'll manage all of our escrows. I raise all the money. So do all the financing and all the structuring for our team. And once we close on a deal, we'll hand it over to Oscar and he handles all of our project management. He has background in construction management, so he's just perfect for the role. And he also manages our sales process, so working with realtors or licensed agents to list our properties. And then as we got into short-term rentals, we realized we needed someone to help set up and launch these rentals. So DJ also handles that on the back end as well, depending on what our exit strategy is. He'll come in and we'll tackle it together, but he'll take lead on making sure the property is set up and ready to go for Airbnb. That's awesome. Let's go into funding and private money. This is what a lot of viewers really want to see and hear about when it comes to you, since you're the private money princess. <laughs> so let's just start with the basic knowledge of what do you guys do with private money and how does that work? Yeah, private money has been so instrumental in unlocking our deal flow because once you understand how private money works you can go after unlimited deals i really mean that we've always worked on the fixing flip side we've always worked with hard money and private money private money is a way for us to do more deals at once by leveraging opm other people's money so using other people's individual either savings accounts or retirement funds to invest in our deals. We give them a double digit return and that's backed by the real estate that we're investing in. So it's really, really powerful because not only does it provide us an opportunity to do more deals, it gives people an opportunity to invest with us in something like real estate and earn really awesome returns. So what kind of returns do you guys offer to your investors in this market? I know it depends. Yeah, it depends deal by deal because every deal has very different numbers, different structures, different ROIs, but on average, we're able to offer 10% annualized returns, which a lot of people don't really get that, right? The stock market, maybe on average will yield 8%, maybe, but over a 30 year investment horizon. So it takes a while to see that, but people want 
more meaningful returns and they want it without all the ups and downs of the stock market. So a 10% annualized return is really awesome and people love that. The best part about it is it's a secured investment, meaning we're using the property as collateral and that way the investor is protected and insured as well. So how do you guys secure the money against the property? How does that work? So there are three really important parts of securing a private money loan on a property. So the first is a promissory note. It's just a pretty straightforward note. It can be a one page document that memorializes your agreement. So the amount, investment amount, or I should say the loan amount, the annualized return and the terms of repayment. When is it due? When does the note mature? So pretty straightforward. That's just a summary of your agreement. You should have a, a lawyer in your individual states create this for you or review it for you. The other one is really, really important, and this is why people love private money loans, is the security instrument. And again, this is going to depend on your state, and you should work with either a lawyer or a title company to get this, to create this document, but that's either a recorded mortgage or what we do in, in California is a, a deed of trust, right? So the deed of trust is pretty much creating a lien against your property that says you owe this person this amount. This property cannot be either resold or transferred without paying off this lien first. So that creates that security in the property and lenders now feel like they have they have their interest secured in something hard like an asset, like real estate, right? That will protect them when you go to sell. You can't just like walk away and never see them again because once you go to sell that property, they'll need to get paid off. And the last thing is also really important is you want to add them to your insurance policies. So whatever kind of insurance policy you're using for us, let's say it's a fix and flip property and we're using a builder's risk policy, we add them as a loss payee or a beneficiary should something happen. If there's a, a hazard like a fire and something happens, they are on the insurance just in case they also need to get paid out. So those are the three key documents. Some other ones may be requested, but those are the three most important that you want to consider when adding a private lender to your deal. It's secured against the property. It seems as though this is almost a no-brainer for somebody that's in the stock market making, I mean, now the stock market is not even making anything. It's promising in a sense, especially when you have a lot of experience. <clears throat> My question is, if you don't have a lot of experience, can you raise private money? How does that work? Absolutely, you can. This is something that Amy Majuri, my coach, always talks about. You can raise private money. You can do deals with no liquidity, no credit, no experience. The most important thing that you want to consider when raising private money, if you don't have experience, is two things. You want to have a really strong deal, right? You want to make sure you will have done all your due diligence. You ran all your numbers. You run it by credible investors or partners who can tell the deal looks good, or you may want to change a few things. So make sure you have a really strong deal that has a lot of upside because that's what you will communicate to your lenders. The other thing is you want to build trust with that lender. Like, hey, you know, I don't have experience, but all of my teammates have a ton of experience. I work with a contractor who has 20 years experience in this market. I work with a lender who's been doing this 15 years. I've been doing this with a realtor who's done 100 a hundred different deals. So you really rely on your team and your ability to structure that team to convey to a private lender that even though you don't have experience, you've done all your homework, you have a strong team and you're able to get them a great return with the deal that you have in front of them. Got it. So you do this for Burr strategy, right? Buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. So for that... It, it makes sense because you're doing forced appreciation, but can you raise money for deals that have cash flow, for instance? Absolutely. That's the beauty of private money. You can apply it in any way you want. Any type of real estate investment, you can use private money, fix and flip, wholesale, buy and holds, even multifamily. So there's so many ways to use private money. 
you just have to structure it in a way that makes sense for you and your deal, but also be able to convey that value to a lender. I know a lot of people who do buy and holds and they bring in private money. So there's no crazy like underwriting process. There's no like typically no points, right? You have really competitive rates and terms. And you just have to convey to the lender what it is you're offering and why we're in them through the deal and why they're offering that and really focus on the total return for that investor. A lot of lenders will lend on buy and holds as well. So you could still use money for buy and holds, which is great. The thing about people just believe that if you have a buy and hold, you can't use other people's money. I believe that you use that for your hotel deal, correct? Here's a key thing that you need to keep in mind. When you structure deals with private money in combination with other institutional lenders, whether that's a bank, whether that's private equity or hard money lender, you have to make sure that they allow you to work with private money and record that lien and protect that their investment. This is why it's important to find people that fit, that fit your people or institutions that fit your business model really well. So on the hotel deal, most may have approached it using an equity raise, but I wanted to work on keeping the equity in house with just our partners. So I structured it in a way with our partners to look for private money lenders, record their liens against the property. So when we do a cash out refinance, we can pay them off. And when it's paid off, we have 100% of that of those profits going into our pockets. And we will have made those lenders some money and it'll get us through the construction phase. So you can also structure with as many lenders as you'd like, just keeping in mind that there are going to be lien positions that you have to communicate about. Got it. Have you thought about why you use that capital instead of a private money all the way for the hotel deal? Why did you structure it the way you did? Yeah, so we have partners that brought us into the deal and they they brought us this deal, which was really incredible because it was off market. We had just talked about the structure and how we wanted to handle it. I mean, at the time, I think we could have probably, we could have done whatever we wanted. We could have definitely done the private money all the way through. At the time, we thought about structuring it with hard money. Well, originally, we wanted to go with long-term financing from the start, so like an SBA loan or something more long-term, but it was going to take way too long to, to close out the loan relative to the closing timeline that the seller wanted. But you're right. We could have used 100% private money. We're looking at about a, almost 3.5. $8 million all in for the purchase and the renovation. So it's a pretty hefty amount of private money. Could we have done it? Yeah, definitely. I think that given the time constraints, we went with the hard money loan and then gapped it with the private money for construction and holding costs. Can you explain gap for the people that don't know gap yeah, funding? Absolutely. So the term gap funding is used to bridge your First loan on a deal with what you need for a down payment or any closing costs. For example, you go to buy a property, almost any lender is going to ask for some sort of down payment, whether it's 5%, 10 or 30%. So the gap is pretty much what you need to get to 100% financing. So I might say, hey, hard money lender, will you cover 80% of this purchase price and maybe my rehab? but I'm going to bring in a private money lender to bring in my 20% down on the purchase. I'm going to have them cover all of my holding costs, including interest payments to the first lender and any closing costs. So now I'm in the deal with zero dollars of my own money. I have hundred percent financing because I brought in gap funding to bridge from the first loan to the hundred percent financing. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So can you cover with the private money? Can you cover different expenses such as escrow fees, title fees, closing costs, different things like that? Absolutely. When you look at your deal, figure out what it is that you want covered in your private money. Or if you want to bring in your own equity into the deal, which I always say there's no need to. But you can cover anything and everything you want. Someone asked me over the weekend, well, hey, I have a a 16 month project, can I borrow private funds to pay myself a management fee during that time? And I said, absolutely. 
One is you need to be very, very clear and transparent with your lender on what it is you're doing and why, but make sure obviously that if you account for those costs in your deal and everything still makes sense, then you can absolutely do that. Holding costs, interest payments, points you want, you can raise private money to cover that. You mentioned the financing or the lender that you find for the main purchase of the property. Do you, how do you find somebody that can be okay with a second lien on the property or with other people financing the rest of the property? Because doesn't that increase risk for lenders? Yeah, this is an important step as you're building out your private money program, because I'll tell you this, there are more hard money lenders out there than there are qualified investors. So when you're making calls to hard money lenders, you need to come from a place of strength. You need to come to them and say, this is my business model. I plan to do five, 10, 20 deals in the future. I would love to work with you, but I need to know that your programs fit my business model. This is really important. So I've interviewed dozens and dozens of hard money lenders, and I always ask this, and I say, this is a part of my business model. This is how we structure our deals, and this is how we do multiple deals. Is this something that you can support? And if they say yes, excellent, I add them to my list. If they say no, well, I, I respectfully decline to work with them. So you just like any other vendor or contractor or partner you work with, you just have to find someone that fits your deal structure or your business model. And they're out there. They're definitely out there. The cool thing that she mentioned that I really like is having that abundance mentality. There are people that are going to match your business model and how you do things, whether it's lenders, whether it's contractors, whether it's private money lenders, you know, maybe there's some people that want to give you money, but they're a haggle to deal with. They're going to be asking you every two seconds, hey, how's it going? How's the project? I didn't get an update today. And it's good just to be able to choose who you work with by putting yourself out there. I want to kind of take a step back and really for some newbie that's just starting out that they know nothing about private money. Let's say that you didn't have this private money sector built out like you do right now. How would you go back in time and build the private money people, the lend hard money lenders, the everything to do with raising private money? What are your tips and tricks on starting fresh from scratch and then building this program and portfolio that you built today? Yeah, I'm going to plug this in because I'm a huge believer that you need a mentor or a coach, or even a colleague to walk you through it. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Someone's already doing it, or someone's already doing, or has experience doing what you want to do. So I recommend getting coached or mentored, and there are programs for everything, wholesale, fixed flip, raising money, there's so many. So for me, the most important thing was getting mentored and, co and coached on private money because that accelerated my learning. And that also protected me and it protected my lenders because I know how to use private money properly by using the right documents, communicating the right way, structuring the deal in a way that made sense. So that's really big. If you can find a community or a mentor to get started, absolutely do that. There's a bunch of free content on YouTube, on Instagram, like follow people who are already doing this and ask questions, right? Because follow Amanda. You can follow me as well. I'm happy to answer any questions. A shout out to my coach, Amy Majuri. She is the queen of private money and she actually runs her own coaching program. So get started that way. Get curious, just start learning. And as you're going through deals, if you're stuck, just pick up the phone and ask somebody. That's awesome. So that's a really good plug because mentorship is one of those things where you get accelerated learning. You protect not only your investors, but you also protect your own time. And it's a lot faster. So the people that want to come and listen to me speak on all these podcasts, you can do that. Or you can just come to a conference and ask me questions and get directly to the source and get higher up and, and build faster. So it's really a matter of finding a way to accelerate your growth. 
so that you're not spending time on things that you shouldn't be spending time on. Learning does take a lot of time. Yeah. That's yeah. And real I quick did. on that, we went to a conference and they kept saying the term uh, compressed time. You need to compress time by doing more with more with less time. And the way you do that is by getting systems from other people or, you know, learning the fast track way. Obviously, you want to be thorough, but making sure that you're not spending more time than you have to on something because that 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 momentum is it's exponential. So definitely spend the right amount of time learning things, but don't don't spend the wrong time doing things that are already out there for you in, you know, a very organized curriculum or through network and regular meetings. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about doing something that's already being done in the real estate space. Awesome. So let's, let's go back and do that crash course for anybody that's listening. Obviously it's not going to be everything you're going to need. <laughs> you're going to really need to dig deeper, but let's say from start, Amanda, how are you going to raise money? How are you going to build all of this that you built today? I will walk you through what I do with any prospective lender. And it's really awesome because what we've built is pretty incredible by now. And we're able to display that through our social media, through events, just really talking about what we what we're doing. And that's key is the first step is you have to talk about what it is you're doing in your business and to create that excitement. So I, I think of it in like four parts. The first is, you know, marketing for the lender, right? You want to build relationships with people, connect, you want to network, you want to talk about what you're doing on social media and people will come to you. And Amy Amy talks about her four second power pitch, and I'm going to share it with you guys. This is really, really powerful. People do this all the time. So if you're an investor and you have deals and it could be anywhere, you could be at the market, you could be in an Uber, you could be at a conference and people say, well, hey, what it is, what is, what is it that you do? Hey, well, I'm based out of Los Angeles and I actually, I'm an investor and I teach, uh, I teach other people how to earn double digit returns back to, back to my real estate. And that piques interest typically like, well, what do you mean? Say more, right? And that's when you can dive into it. So there are a lot of ways to connect with different lenders, but let's say that you have a lender that you want to present an opportunity to. And remember, this is really important. You're not, you're not asking for money you're presenting an opportunity to lend in your business and earn healthy returns backed by real estate, okay? So that's a mindset shift as well. When you have a lender that you want to, you know, that you want to talk about a deal with, don't jump to the deal right away. And this is very common. Okay, I'm going to get them on the phone with them. I'm going to get on Zoom. I'm going to walk them through my deal. And that's not what it's about. The first step is you have to build a relationship with that person. It could be someone that you already know, but you need to build a build trust with them within the space of, of what you're doing, whether that's real estate or something else. You need to sit down with them, have a 30 minute call on Zoom, and I will I run them through my private money presentation that talks about who we are, where we invest, what our strategies are, our buying criteria, how private money works. And I explain to them as much as I can to build trust and answer their questions. My goal is not to pitch a deal to them in the first meeting. My goal is to get them comfortable with my team, to get them comfortable with private lending, so that at the end of the meeting, they're comfortable giving you a soft commitment. And at that point, you say, hey, well, I'm super excited. Now I'm going to go hunt for a deal for you that makes sense for your criteria, right? You need to build the trust first and build your presentation to give to them first before you're getting them into a deal. That's super key before you get into any private lending relationship. So I heard a lot of people talk about, you should always be raising money. Is this what you mean by that? Is you should always have these conversations consistently throughout time, not only when you get a deal. Cause I feel like it'd be really tough to fund a deal right when you meet somebody and just asking for 50,000 or a hundred thousand dollars, you know what I mean? Right. Because that comes off as a little bit desperate, like, Hey, I got a deal. I got a deal. I know we just met, but you have to be raising private money all the time. I'm having meetings or presentations every week, even if we don't have deals, because I want to know that when the deal mm -hmm. comes up and the opportunity arises, I'm able to close using that pulling from my list of private money lenders. So always raise money 
I think you would agree. <laughs> You've probably experienced this and so have I. When, you're, when you have a deal and you need to close in two or three weeks and you don't have the money lined up yet, it's stressful. So how cool would it be to have your list of all your soft commitments and go to that list, reach out to them, present opportunities, say, hey, first come, first serve, who would like to lend on this awesome deal, right? That is much more powerful than the other way around. So you just have to tell your lenders, hey, so excited for your commitment. I'm going to be working on acquiring a few more deals. I'll reach out when I have a deal for you. And that's all it takes. So with that, let's say I'm interested in lending with you, right? I have $100,000 uh, sitting in my home equity, right? And I want to invest with you. What's the next step? You have this conversation. You tell me about private money. We learn about it. And will you call me up when there's a deal? Will you email me? Will you put me in your consistent email thread? Every investor does it differently. What I do is I add them to my master list and I put in their name, their information, their commitment about amount. Maybe they have a specific term in mind. And as we have deals come up, I'll look at that list and I'll actually, people do it differently. I'll actually go in and I'll pick specific lenders to structure the deal in a way that is most beneficial, making sure that I'm power matching between the lender and between the deal. And I'll reach out to that person. There's one other step that's really important, right? When you present a deal, I put together, it's called a deal packet. And it talks about all of the, the deal. It, it, it talks about all the, the, the information on the deal. So what are you buying it for? What are you putting in? Like, what's the scope of work? What are the comparables? Whatever your exit strategy is, put that put that in a specific deal packet. So when you reach out to them, you give them something to look at. If they have questions, maybe they want to schedule another meeting, you go over the deal together and they decide at that point if they're interested in lending on that deal or if they want to wait for another one. So that's a good point. Do you think that having a deal packet and running your numbers and, and really showing all the numbers helps in raising money? Or do you think that people should go down the lazy route and just, hey, these are the details, purchase price, rehab, fee. this is how much money we're asking for the down payment, done. So again, this is about building trust. So if someone called you and said, hey, I got this deal, this is, this is what it's looking like. Or hey, here's the presentation or a deal packet with all the items I've called. I've worked with the broker to come up with an after repaired value. I had a contractor put together a bid like, that's that contributes to building trust with that lender. So that's honestly what I think everyone should be doing is creating that deal packet. I do have lenders sometimes that are like, I don't even need to see the deal. I trust you. Just tell me where to put the money because we've done deals together already. So when you're working with someone for the first time, put everything on paper, be as professional as you can with creating that opportunity for them and having them see, see it. And you don't need to show them how much money you're making in the deal. You need to just show them the most important things, which are, okay, what are you buying it for? How much money are you putting in? How much do you think you can sell it for, right? If you're doing a fix and flip and what is the ask? So how much money are you raising and what is their expected return on that? That's all they need to see. Some people are pretty, you know, detached from the process and they don't really care. And they're like, I trust you. Let's move forward. Some are like, Hey, send me your deal analysis. Right. Some people want to get into the, in, into the details of the Excel sheet. And I'm okay with that too, because at the end of the day, I need to be transparent and I need to build trust with that lender so that they feel comfortable moving forward in the deal and potentially several more after that. Awesome. And you seem to have all these great connections, but there are people out there that work in healthcare or work in, you know, different industry. How are they supposed to raise the money? Just playing devil's advocate here. What do you recommend to somebody like that? Those are the best people to raise the money because in the real estate space, like you have different, you have different degrees of your network. Real estate people are, you know, they know other real estate people, but if you're in a completely different network, like healthcare, or maybe you work in banking, or maybe you work in, I don't know, construction, you have a completely different set of people in a brand new network that you can reach. So you almost have an advantage because you're, you're reaching out to people that are 
that probably haven't heard about this before, that you haven't tapped into that value and you have an opportunity to educate these people on what it is that real estate private lending is. So you absolutely have an advantage if you have connections to all of these other networks. In fact, Amy teaches us, don't just reach out to real estate people, reach out to people outside of that in any and all industries and think about who it, who are the type of people that are probably going to have funds that they want to put to use. And that falls into several categories. Cool. So when you say reach out, do you recommend texting them? Do you recommend calling them? Do you recommend, should I just stay within my family or should I reach out to old coworkers? I feel like there's some people out there that would be scared to call or message old coworkers. So how do you go about doing that? You can reach out to all of those people. Some people say they don't want to start with family and friends, and that's okay because there are systems and methods to reaching out to complete strangers and getting them on board with your deals. So you have to get very strategic about how you do it. I think that different methods methods apply to different groups of people. I think phone calls are very powerful, but also following up with in-person meetings. But a lot of people do like cold calls or, or cold messaging, even on LinkedIn, right? You just have to know how to mess, how to position yourself in a way that's going to get them to talk to you and what to say in your messaging. So the goal is to get them on the phone, give them the quick intro on what it is that you're doing and how you can provide value to them or their clients or their network. And you can really create a lot of opportunities from people that you don't even know. So that's the most exciting part about private money. You can really raise it from anyone and everyone. I have crazy stories about people that I've raised money from that I just had never anticipated. So you just have to open your mind to it and you have to be really confident when you approach them. That's awesome. So that's great. That gives a lot of insight into how to raise money. And you'd be open to, I'm assuming you'd be open to people reaching out to you if they have any other questions about that. Yep, absolutely. So, awesome. So we'll we'll get to that later. I do want to ask you about how much money, if you feel comfortable sharing, how much money you've raised. Yep. How many deals have you done? And what's kind of going on with Amanda? <laughs> yeah, for sure. We've done deals now. We're in our 13th deal. We've we started in like late 2020 is when we really started doing deals. And so we've done 13 deals since then. I raised the money on behalf of our team and I've been able to raise about two and a half million dollars with the help of my team and the help of our systems and their support. So two and a half million dollars and that's climbing. You know, we get a lot of soft commitments here and there. People just referring friends and family or, or lenders to us because they see us and they trust what we're doing. So uh, two and a half million. And that, that is definitely growing. And it's been incredible because I think all of those lenders have are repeat lenders, meaning they close out a deal with us and they've come back for a second or a third. So it's only going to grow further. I mean, the more money you make for these lenders, the more they're going to trust you and the more money they have to give to you. Exactly. So endless loop. And you're starting and it, it's fascinating how much you've done in almost two years and almost two years you've done 13 deals how many of those were airbnbs four of those are our airbnbs that we we have three active one is launching in about a month or so month and a half and the rest of them have been fixed and flips or actually the hotel so that's the, the fifth one yeah. yeah let's go back to burr into airbnb first why okay. do you do burr into airbnbs I like getting free Airbnbs. And what that means is we don't like putting our, our own, money, own money into the deal because who, who wants to be tying up their own cash? So the best way to create value is by buying a distressed asset, foreseeing the appreciation, and then being able to refinance that deal with $0 into that property. That's incredible. So tell me, Patrick, what is the cash on cash returns for zero dollars into your deal um i don't know i'm not a mathematician but okay, i yeah. do believe that's infinite returns <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly so that's really why we do burrs because 
we can buy turnkey, absolutely. But when you have a skill set like we have to buy properties at a discount and manage construction and build out something beautiful, we're going to get the most value for ourselves, for our partners, and for our lenders. That's great. And let's talk about that hotel deal now. I mean, you bought a hotel deal with none of your own money. Yeah, that's correct. That's yep. crazy. People can't even imagine affording a hotel, yet alone <laughs> paying zero dollars out of pocket to acquire that hotel. How free how, hotel? <laughs> yeah. How many how many dollars worth of assets have you acquired through private money and through other lenders? Well. I created a graph on this the other day because we we presented a conference this past weekend. And up to this point, we've transacted about 13.5 million in buying, renovating and selling real estate. And uh, I would say we do use hard money, but a lot of it has been private money. So we've been able to transact quite a bit. And I have to check on our current asset value, but we currently have those four rental properties. We're about to sell a fix and flip. And then we have that hotel, which is think, you know, a $3 million, it's valued at a little bit over $3 million. So it's been really incredible. So you've been able to buy $13 million worth of assets in two years with private money for the most part. Yeah. So we've been able to transact 13 million. So that's in acquisitions, in renovations and in sales. So it's quite a bit of money. I don't have the acquisition value, but We've, I mean, it's probably in the like eight, nine, ten million dollar range in properties that we've actually been able to acquire using the help of private money. So it's really incredible. It's really incredible because we didn't. Can you imagine all those down payments if it weren't for these private lenders? Like that's yeah. not something that we have access to. Is all that cash for down payments? So it's been instrumental. It really has. So Amanda, what were you doing before this? Or were you some crazy networker and that's how you were able to meet all these people and get, I know DJ is really good at networking, but you guys are, I mean, what, what were you guys doing before this? Gosh, we were all in very different worlds. So I was working, I worked for in corporate America, corporate America for 10 years. I have an engineering background and an MBA and I worked primarily in the energy industry. So I was working for oil and gas. I worked in renewables. And before I got laid off in 2019, I was working for a solar developer. I was doing large scale solar development. So I was working a lot in like land development and project management, nothing with real estate yet. So it was pretty interesting. But David, my husband, DJ, people, people trip out on this a little bit, but he was he was an archaeologist so he had a master's in archaeology and he had been doing california desert archaeology for a few years doing it full time and now he's full time with us in real estate oscar has a background he's has like 14 years of experience in construction management so he was working with some pretty big names he was doing project management construction project management for like nike and turner and we all decided one day that we wanted to build something for ourselves. So pretty, pretty crazy, different backgrounds, but here we are and we're not turning back. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and that's great to hear. Honestly, your story is very inspiring to a lot of people. And I can imagine that you've probably inspired dozens and dozens of people already. And you're hopping on this call right now to talk and spit knowledge and free knowledge that people pay thousands and thousands of dollars for. And it just shows what kind of human being you are. And that's, that's the reason why I love to really just chat it up with you. So thank you for, for sharing yeah. your story and really just motivating people. It's, 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 it shows that, I mean, you are special, but at the same time, you're not like super woman, right? Like anybody can do this. It's not rocket science. It's pretty simple and straightforward. You just got to be able to put in the work. And that's what I'm, you know, getting out of this. A am I right? Or yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And I, I tell people that the reason why I'm here is because someone inspired me one day. So I'm just paying it forward and just telling my story, just an average person trying to do extraordinary things, which anyone is capable of just start, just, you know, get to work and start meeting people get inspired and not just get inspired but convert that into action if you take massive action 
you'll be really surprised by what it is you can build for yourself and for your families. That's amazing. So what's your why going into this? I, I really didn't even talk about that, but I, I, I don't even know. What is yeah. your why? Gosh, the why is, I feel like it's constantly evolving and we check in. I say we, like our team, we check in with this all the time. And I try to peel back the layers and figure out like what it is that really drives me every day. And at the surface, I want to build something for our families. Like I want to build generational wealth. It's not something that I come from my back. My socioeconomic background is, is it's something that I want to change for my family and for future generations, because it's not something that we were ever taught is how to build wealth. So that's, that's really important. And applying that to I'm Mexican American. So my goal is to also spread that with other minorities, making sure that they're building their generational wealth, that they're getting access to opportunities and to knowledge. But at the end of the day, I think when it really comes down to it, I always tell myself like, my why is to inspire others and to also be inspired. That's really what it comes down to because I feel like when you're inspired, you really get the most out of life and you, you really become the best version of yourself. That was, that was deep. That was great. And, and you clearly are a giving person um, by nature and very inspiring to anybody that's Hispanic American. Is that what you mentioned? Yep. Mexican American, Hispanic. Yep. Mexican, Mexican American. Yeah. I do want to kind of finish this up and tie everything together. So let me ask you a couple questions about you. I'm going to fire off like three questions. <laughs> that I want you to answer. This is so basic, but let's just do it your favorite book and why? Oh my goodness. I feel like this is so, it's so basic, but Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I should have read that when I was 18 <laughs> years old, but I read it in my twenties. And that's when I really understood how the world worked. And it opened my eyes up to many more, even more, even more powerful books. So that was one that really just started to change my mindset for the better. Awesome. And what advice would you give to people that are listening right now? The number one takeaway that you want people to have. Just take action. A forward momentum will get you to where you need to be. So despite the challenges or the fear or the voice in your head that's telling you no, just keep moving forward. And you'll that incremental progress every day will take you somewhere amazing down the road. Awesome. And so where, where are you headed now, Amanda? What's, what's new for Amanda? What's Amanda working on? Let's see. So we're working on a few things, pretty exciting. We want to get more into like a narrow and deep expertise in the short-term rental space. So I know that's, that's your realm, Patrick. I know that's what you're super excited about. And we want to spend more time looking at this turnkey Airbnb model. So how can we work with clients to acquire awesome deals build out their Airbnbs, manage the construction, make them beautifully furnished and decorated and launch them as incredible rentals all over the country. So that's something that we're exploring as a team and we want to get really, really good at in the future. Great. So you're venturing outside of Joshua Tree. Yes. Yes. Wow. Start to, starting to look at okay. other markets. Finally, we built our, a really great reputation in this space, but we want to see what else is out there. Okay, great. And how can people find you? How can people contact you? Yep. So on Instagram, you can find me underscore Amanda Fornelli underscore. And if you click on my link tree, everything else is on there. So you can find our website, our Airbnbs. You can direct message me. And if you want to chat some more, we're, I'm happy to set up some time to Calendly. So reach out, say hello, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And Amanda... Thank you so much. You are such a giving person. I'm going to say it one more time. You're awesome. You're a boss lady. I'm so happy I met you. And you're just amazing. Keep doing what you're doing and wish you the best of luck. <laughs> Thank you, Patrick. I love what you're doing. Thank you for putting this together. You're such an awesome part of the community. I appreciate it.